So, started recording. Let me remind you, last time we talked about hyperkähler manifolds. So these are manifolds with three different complex structures that interact with each other like the quaternions. So there's sort of some quaternionic upgrade of complex manifolds. And we talked about sort of the context of these in differential geometry, but one of the things we talked about is they're kind of hard to construct. And one approach to constructing them is that you can actually phrase this hyperkähler structure in terms of complex geometry and get these twister spaces. Um, and someone, I'm not forgetting who, I don't know, probably Matthew, sounds like the kind of question he would ask, um, asked about the kind of phys, or maybe it was Hugh actually, yeah, okay, uh, about sort of physical inspiration for twister theory. And, and let me like not try to say very much about this because I will probably not do a good job if I try to explain it. Um, but the sort of very general idea is to the twister theory gen means a kind of more general approach of you have some physical system it's as cp ones in some other space and this seems like a weird thing to do but it allows you to rephrase things about metric geometry in terms of holomorphic geometry which is often easier and you can interpret kind of physics on your original space in purely holomorphic terms on this twister space. Um, and Penrose had originally done this. He had sort of some success taking or can people hear me okay? Uh, okay. Um, some success turning, you know, already understood like general relativity into things in terms of twister space. Um, the idea was more to get something like quantum gravity and uh, well, I don't, I don't think there's a one consensus way to quantize gravity yet, but a lot of people are still thinking about it. So, um, you know, it has shown up various places in string theory, et cetera. But it also has, has these interesting applications in mathematics. So I should say sort of, you know, I'm not gonna go into this in, in detail, but, you know, in purely mathematical terms, there's sort of interesting stuff about rephrasing solutions to certain differential equations on um, hyperkähler manifolds in sort of purely holomorphic terms on the twister space. Um, so there are uh, sort of more than just, oh, this twister space exists. You can sort of take problems for your original manifold and rephrase them in the twister space. All right, are there any questions? about either stuff we did last time or this. This is just kind of, I thought I should have a slightly better answer to what, uh, what the relationship was. Um, but it's also, I don't know, it, it, right? The, there is this problem of like uh, the, the stuff in the physics literature, it's always phrased in very different terms. So it can be hard to kind of process exactly what the connection is. Um, All right, so what I wanna talk about today is a different and you know, very important way of constructing interesting hyperkähler manifolds, um, which is taking hyperkähler quotients. So this is a quaternionized version or a kind of doubled version of doing symplectic reduction. So let me just remind you, uh, if we have a Kähler manifold, then we can look for Hamiltonian group actions on that Kähler manifold that respect the complex structure or equivalently, which are isometries for the Kähler metric. Um, and if we're in the nice case where G is acting freely properly on that inverse image, then the symplectic reduction, so the moment map level mod the action of this group is actually a Kähler manifold um, with the metric, the complex structure and the symplectic form inherited in the obvious way. Um, let me just say one tiny bit about this. So um, we have that 
the tangent space to this symplectic quotient at a given point, well, that has a surjective map from the, um, uh, do, do, do. tangent space to mu zero. And I'm at, assuming that I'm at a regular level of the moment map. So this T star of mu zero, that's, this is a subspace inside um, do, 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 the tangent space to my original manifold, which I was calling M. Uh, and the kernel of this map, so the tangent space at X to the G orbit through X, that is the, the kernel of the map down to the symplectic reduction. All right, so if I have a, a fixed metric, then I have a canonical splitting of this map, right? So because I have a metric, look at this tangent space mu inverse of zero mod G is canonically isomorphic to the perp to uh, the tangent space to the orbit intersect with mu inverse of zero. And that the perp to the tangent space, the orbit might sound familiar, right? The symplectic orthogonal to the tangent space to the orbit is this tangent space to T to the moment map level. So really what I'm telling you here is the tangent space to the reduction is the intersection of the perp to the uh, tangent space to the orbit, both under the symplectic form and under the metric, right? Um, so this is equal to the stuff which satisfies, ooh, geez. I don't know why this has gotten so bad lately. You know, X is in the tangent space at X to the full manifold G. And we have both that the symplectic form and the metric vanish for Y in this tangent space to the orbit. So it's sort of a, a geometrically natural thing. But this is a subspace of a metric space has an induced inner product on it. And that's the metric down on the reduction. So it's not totally obvious, but a little bit of work shows that actually this metric is Kähler with Kähler form given by the reduced symplectic form. So for example, this is a, a quick and easy proof that CPN is Kähler, right? CPN, this is the reduction of CN plus one for the uh, action of unit complex numbers. Um, so it's do, do, do. We often write symplectic reduction as a double slash, so. CPN is CN plus one, double slash S1. All right, so that's a nice way of constructing Kähler manifolds, but we already knew quite a few Kähler manifolds because all proje smooth projective varieties are examples of Kähler manifolds. Hyper Kähler ones are much harder to produce, but one way of doing that is via this reduction. All right, so now, instead of assuming that M, my starting manifold was Kähler, assume that it's hyper Kähler. And that now the action of G is tri-Hamiltonian. So it's how I have three different symplectic forms coming omega I, omega J, omega K. And 
I want to assume that I'm Hamiltonian for all three of those symplectic forms. So I have three moment maps, omega uh, mu i, mu j, mu k, for the three different symplectic forms, omega i, omega j, omega k. All right, well, before I had one symplectic form and I took a level of that one symplectic form and modded out by it. Now I take a level of all three different symplectic forms and I intersect them. So the hyper Hamiltonian reduction uh, is what happens when I take the pre-image of zero for mu one, mu i, mu j, mu k intersect all three of those and then mod out by the group G. Um, and this sort of has this nice effect of it actually sort of, I mean, okay, I saw the crying emoji that looks kind of complicated, but again, right? Like you can think of symplectic reduction as if you just mod out by the group, well, you sort of screw up the symplectic form. You have things now that we're supposed to have non-trivial pairing under the symplectic form that don't have anything to pair with anymore. And so you have to get rid of all the vectors that point off of the moment map level. Screwing up all three symplectic forms, so you have to fix all three of them. All right, so theorem, if G acts freely properly on this intersection of moment map levels, then this hyper Hamiltonian reduction is a hyper Kähler manifold. Um, and the kind of key observation here, one of the, the kind of key facts that allows you to work with hyper Kähler manifolds is this observation we had before that if I'm thinking in the complex structure for I, I can take the other two moment maps so I have I and I have mu I, then that inner, you know, and omega I, and that just behaves like the usual Kähler world. And if I sort of treat that as my standard complex structure, then mu J plus I mu K is the moment map for the complex symplectic form. So remember, Recall that omega C equals omega uh, J plus I omega K is holomorphic in both variables. So it's a, it's a two zero, complex valued two zero form. Um, and so you can work out that if you just sort of ignore the fact that this is over the complex numbers and think in a kind of formal way, the moment map for this complex valued symplectic form will be the complex valued moment map mu j plus i mu k. Uh, and that's going to be a holomorphic map with respect to i. So if I take the inverse image of zero under this complexified moment map, so that's taking two of my moment map levels, then that's a complex submanifold of the complex manifold M with respect to the complex structure I. And so it's Kähler with respect to I and the pulled back symplectic form, right? So something we saw before when we talked about complex geometry is if you're a complex submanifold, then you're automatically symplectic with respect to any compatible symplectic form. And using the stuff about um, Kähler potentials, we saw even better that you're actually a Kähler manifold. All right, so I've kind of already gotten rid of mu j and mu k by restricting to the zero level of their moment map. I still have mu i on the zero level and that's still the moment map of a Hamiltonian G action. 
um, right? Nothing has changed about the relationship between the action of G and the moment map mu i. All right, so I can think of this hyper Hamiltonian reduction instead of as I intersect the three moment map levels all at once and I mod out by G as I first set the second two moment maps to zero and then I'm doing a Hamiltonian reduction with respect to mu i. So actually this guy, this triple guy, right? This is on mu, in, mu c inverse of zero. I restrict to the zero level of the moment map mu i and I mod out by g. Um, which means that this guy is Kähler with respect to i by the theorem I discussed before. It's a Kähler quotient because I'm taking a Kähler thing and doing symplectic reduction of it. But there's nothing special about i. I can do exactly the same argument, but swapping the rules of i and j or i and k. So if I sort of privilege each of my complex structures separately, or in fact, any uh, point in the unit sphere given by them, right? I can check for each one of those separately that my reduced, and so it's hyperkähler because it's Kähler for that whole sphere of complex structures. All right, so this is actually like a pretty easy theorem. I mean, you have to kind of believe this thing about Kähler reduction as a black box, um, which is, you know, it's not totally trivial, but it's not extremely difficult. You just kind of have to think about um, oops, how how this this uh, yeah how this metric behaves. I mean, one thing that's worth noting here, yeah. Uh, so let me let me just say, my the M I'm always going to use is just the usual a bunch of copies of the quaternions. So H to the N, which I can think of as C to the two N. I can think of it as C to the two N in a bunch of different ways depending on which complex structure I prefer. Um, now that is a boring hyperkähler manifold. In particular, it has trivial holonomy. But when I do this reduction, I will actually get interesting, complicated hyperkähler metrics, which will have interesting holonomy. All right. So, well, if I'm going to do such a reduction, I'd better come up with some hyper Hamiltonian actions on this guy. And, uh, this group I introduced before, the, the unitary matrices with uh, quaternion coefficients, or SPN, remember it's called that because it's the maximal compact of SP2NC, um, that acts on HN, and you, it's not too hard to check that it acts hyper Hamiltonian. with the moment map being exactly what you would expect from the case of the symplectic group over R or the unitary group over R acting on, yeah, I should say unitary. Uh, so analogy, CN is Kähler, boringly, and UNC acts on here, preserving the Kähler structure. Um, so we talked previously about, oh, geez, the full, we, the full SP2NR acting on here, but that doesn't preserve the Kähler structure. It doesn't um, preserve the metric. So uh, I'm going to on, only have an action preserving the Kähler structure if it sits inside U and C. All right. Uh, but we, we know a moment map for all of SP2NR, um, which is exactly given by, uh,
by the, the pairing of the symplectic form, uh, sorry, the pairing of an element of the Lie algebra with the moment map is given by applying the symplectic form to that guy applied to V, V, and I think there's a one half here. All right. And since that's a moment map for all of SP2N, it's a moment map on any subgroup. So in particular, it's a moment map on UNC. All right, so you do the same thing for UNH. The only thing you have to change is, well, now I have to apply that same formula for the three different symplectic forms. Um, uh, the sort of case of this I want to emphasize, at least first, is one we've talked about quite a bit, which is what happens when you have a torus uh, acting. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this guy, so standard mod S1 to the N, so Rn mod two pi, times z to the n. This gets sent to the quaternion valued matrix. Theta one up to theta n goes to e to the i theta one, e to the i theta n. And I should note here, right, this is again, it's privileging i. This is uh, giving i a sort of special place here. I could put j or I could put k there, but then I would have a genuinely different action. And the fact that I've privileged I manifests in the fact that the moment map for I looks very different from the moment maps for J and K. So the moment map for I looks basically like the one we had before. So remember before what we got was minus one half times the norm squared of the different components, which is just kind of building up from the fact that the action on one copy of C was um, the yeah was was given by minus one half times the norm squared, but now, well, this e to the i theta, this when I look at this acting on the quaternions, I have you know three basis vectors, and. So this acts on this copy of C in the usual way by e to the i theta, but you can check that on this copy of C, it acts by e to the minus i theta. Uh, it rotates this copy the other direction. Um, and that's basically because it's the dual representation. So because it's going in the opposite direction, um, the coordinates go the other way. So uh, I have this minus sign here. Uh, I should emphasize, um, I'm looking at my quaternion is of the form Z plus WJ. So I'm, I'm hesitant to use my index I here because uh, I'll just use a different index. Z sub K, W sub K, J. Um, all right. So this formula is exactly just expressing the fact that I rotate uh, the span of one and I, like the usual action on complex numbers and the span of J and K in the opposite way. And that's why I put that minus sign. And then if I look at the complex moment map, what I get is this very different looking formula. I get Z1 times W1 as complex numbers. And all the way down to Zn times Wn as complex numbers. Um, and uh, of course I could get mu j and mu k separately by taking the real and imaginary parts of this expression. Um, 
So this guy is essentially taking the dot product of these two vectors, and then I can take its real and imaginary parts. Um, and I should just say what's, what's going on here, right? So yeah, maybe, maybe this is actually kind of worth writing out. The complex, uh, the symplectic form for I on the quaternions pairs these guys, right? So if I write my quaternion as A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, then omega I is DA wedge DB plus DC wedge DD. Okay, D was a bad choice, but you know, I hope you understand. Um, whereas omega J is DA DC plus uh, DD wedge DB. Um, did I have that right? No, I think I, yeah, right. Um, and here I'm using the fact that J times K is equal to I, right? So if I want J to act like I on that, that set of coordinates, I should send K to one and uh, I to I. Um, and W K is equal to D A D D plus D A wedge D B. Uh, sorry, no, that's wrong. D B wedge D C. Um, the thing to note about these formulas is B C and D are permuting cyclically. It always comes up these cyclic permutations. So. Um, and you can sort of work this out explicitly from how things work, but the way things always go in the quaternions is the imaginary things, everything stays okay if you permute things cyclically. All right. And so exactly what's coming out here is, um, you know, this ZI times WI, well, I'm pairing up coordinates corresponding to either I and J and uh, one and J and I and K or uh, one and K and I and J. I'll leave it to you to, to work that out carefully, but that's, that's the basic idea of where it comes from. All right. Any questions? Right, you can also um, sort of naively get this, or maybe not that naively, but um, you can get this by thinking of HN as T star CN with um, Z being the coordinate on CN. Uh, w being the coordinate on the cotangent fiber. And then mu c is the tautological symplectic form. It's sort of the usual symplectic form. I, I think it was actually canonical symplectic form. Um, but sort of a holomorphic version of it. Um, and so this is actually just the usual formula for the moment map of any action on the base 
lifted up to the cotangent bundle un, under the tautological, the canonical symplectic form. So sort of that's why it's it's a nice formula like this. All right, so one important special case is, well, I don't necessarily want to think about the whole thing. If I think about the whole diagonal torus, my hyper Hamiltonian reduction will be a point. That's not interesting. So it would be much more interesting to think about a smaller subgroup, and then I'll have something interesting positive dimensional left over when I mod out. So one possibility is the diagonal. Right, I have theta, I send it to e to the i theta, e to the i theta, et cetera. All right, so the moment map for i is one half times, ooh, I should put parentheses there, omega, the sum of all the w i squared minus the z i squared. All right, and the complex moment map is the dot product of the vectors z and w. And note, I'm not taking Hermitian dot product, it's the real just normal old dot product. So what does the hyperkähler reduction look like in this case? If I take the inverse of zero for just the complex moment map, so again, I'm expecting that to be a complex subvariety, indeed, because the complex moment map is holomorphic, as we can see from these formulas. Well, it's pairs of vectors whose dot product is zero. Now that has actually a kind of natural geometric interpretation. If I fix Z, I can think of all the W, which pair triv have trivial dot product with it, as the cotangent space to Pn minus one at the line spanned by Z. Um, this is if Z is not zero. Right, so the tangent space to projective space is all of Cn mod the line spanned by Z. So I, when I dualize, I get that the cotangent space is all the stuff that's perpendicular to Z. So if you think about this, this means that when I take the inverse image of zero under the complex moment map, and I throw out all the guys where Z is zero, we'll worry about those in a moment, um, then that has a natural map to T star PN minus one which is I send Z to the line in PN minus one spanned by Z, specifically got rid of the case where Z is zero, so I don't have to worry about that. And then W goes to the corresponding cotangent vector. And actually it turns out that as long as my, um, I should have, so as we've discussed, right, when you wanna, reduce at a moment map level, you can either shift your moment map and reduce at zero, or you can just reduce at some uh, non-zero level of your moment map. And I, I started doing that. That's okay, these groups are abelian, so I can do reduction at any, any point in the dual of the Lie algebra. So if the level I reduce at is negative, then actually this induces an isomorphism from this, inverse image of zero under the complex moment map intersected with the inverse image of C under the moment map for I modded out by this action of S1. Um, and let's take a moment to think about why that's so. Um, well, if I put in Z equals zero, then looking at this formula for mu I, I get one half norm of the vector W. So in particular, I can't get anything that's negative. I can only get non-negative real numbers if uh, this term is zero. 
I, uh, I'm too used to working on a board. I, I, I think if I cover this, the, the thing on the iPad with my hand, you won't be able to see it, but actually that doesn't work. Um, but if this term goes away, the, this moment map is positive. So we have to specialize the case where C is negative. That forces Z to be non-zero. That's the only way I can get C under this moment map. Um, for i and I intersect it with the inverse image of zero for the complex moment map. Sorry about that. Um, my uh, my home internet is very unreliable, and it's kind of amazing. This is the first time I uh, have lost my connection. Um, so sorry about that, but I'm back. Uh, oh, I need to put my screen up again. Do, 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 do. Okay, um, so sorry, let me, I don't know exactly where I was when I froze. I had gotten as far as saying, okay, let's take the inverse image of C under uh, the moment map mu sub i and intersect that with the inverse image of zero under the complex moment map. So that's looking at, um, Right, what, what would hit a given line and choice of uh, W there? Well, I have to have that all the Z primes mapping down, right? So, so basically the only choice I get to make is which vector in that line do I take, right? And by fixing C, I fixed what the norm of that vector should be. So my W is fixed. So I fixed the right-hand side of this equation. And so I fixed the left-hand side of this equation. Um, so Z has a fixed length. And so I get a single S1 orbit of points uh, in this pre-image. And so if I mod out by S1, I just get an isomorphism. Now you'll note here, right, if what you're interested in is the hyperkähler metric, this is actually going to be a little bit complicated because the size of the orbit keeps changing, right? Having chosen a metric, I actually get to ask, how big is this orbit, right? And that keeps changing. So that's going to matter um, for what the metric is downstairs. Um, you know, in this case, it's, it's not going to be too bad. But actually, in general, it's quite hard to write the hyperkähler metrics that come out of these reductions, even when you can come up with nice coordinates on the reduction. All right. And you know, one of the things that's kind of less obvious about this is, so this gives me a complete hyperkähler metric on T star PN minus one. And uh, the usual complex structure I'm used to on T star PN minus one is I. What are the other ones? So J and K are complex structures which rotate vectors out of the zero section of PN into the cotangent fiber over PN. They're weird. They're very weird if you're thinking of this as T star PN. Uh, and you can actually check that under these complex structures, what you get are smooth affine varieties of the form of matrices such that X squared is CX. Um, and basically the way you see this is if I 
rotate the hypercalar structures. If I rename I to be J and J to be K and K to be I, that has the same effect as rotating my choice of moment map levels. So now instead of taking a non-zero moment map level for mu I and zero for mu C, I'm taking the zero level for mu I and a non-zero level for mu C. Um, and uh, when you do that, um, what you find is, uh, right, I'm getting the equations. Let me actually write this out. You know, instead of having the dot product of V and W be zero, I'm getting that their dot product is C. Right, and then I'm modding out by uh, acting on this guy by uh, S1, right? S1 is acting on here by Z goes to E to the I theta Z and W goes to E to the minus I theta Z. And one nice way to get rid of that Z1 action is to look at the N by N matrix where I multiply these vectors in the dumb direction. So I think of that as a row vector, and then I multiply that times W. And I get, so I get a rank one N by N matrix. Uh, and you can check that this dot product property exactly means that the square of that matrix is C times the original matrix. Um, All right, so in the case of T star P1, this is what's called the uh, eguchi hansen metric. So this is like the easiest example of a hyperkähler metric in the world. And there is a reasonable formula for it. I kind of looked through some papers to see if I could find a formula that was nice enough that I actually wanted to write it down. But like, you actually have to go through a kind of lengthy explanation of exactly which coordinates are you taking on this space. It ends up getting a little bit complicated. Um, but it, you know, it, it is reasonable, but this is the easiest imaginable case, getting T star P1. And even there, it's, it's a non-trivial thing, if not an extremely difficult one. And you know, it's just gonna get harder from there. All right, um, I think I'm gonna take a short break. So my throat is getting a little scratchy. Um, so I will be back in a few minutes and you guys can think about uh, any questions you have. Remember to resume the recording. It'd be bad if I forgot to. Oops. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> uh, I, I am on the headset, right? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm back. So uh, did anyone come up with any questions while I was gone? So this is just one kind of simple example of a whole sort of zoo of constructions you can do. The one sort of special case that I like very much is to take subgroups of this circle action. When you do hyperkähler reductions by those, they're called hypertoric varieties, or there are some people who insist that that's a bad name, that they should be called toric hyperkähler varieties, which I think is awful. So what can you do? Um, so let me just remind you with toric varieties, right, what you do is you choose a subtorus and a moment map level. This gives you an affine embedding of Rn into some bigger Rd as an affine subspace. And the structure of the toric variety that comes out when you do the reduction has to do with taking that image of Rn and intersecting it with the negative orthit, basically because when I take Cn and I look at its moment map image, that's the whole negative orthit. I should say C to the D here. Um, its moment map image is the whole orthant. And so if I do the reduction of C of D, um, 
with respect to the smaller torus, I get something whose moment map image is the intersection between this affine subspace and the orthon, which is of course a polytope. Well, now in this hypertoric world, right, uh, my moment map image, do, 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 where's my actual formula? Here's my actual formula. Um, well, there's no reason that this number would be positive. It's the difference of two squares. So it could be positive, it could be negative, it could be either. Similarly here, there's no reason, there's no restriction on what kind of values you can get for this guy. Um, so suddenly you're, you're seeing the whole space for uh, HN, this moment map level, it's, it's the whole space. Uh, sorry, the moment map image is the whole space. But something interesting still happens over the coordinate hyperplanes. Um, that's the image of all the critical points of the moment map. Um, so we're still getting something interesting, uh, but basically in, instead of getting just one polytope in Rn, we get Rn, and then we have a bunch of hyperplanes where something more complicated is happening over those hyperplanes. Um, so, well, you know, there, I could do like several lectures on uh, the structure we get here, but, you know, one interesting thing to note is, well, if I have a hyperplane arrangement, well, let me draw a slightly more interesting example of one like this, then I see some polytopes. I see a polytope here and a polytope here, right? And those have corresponding toric varieties. So this one is CP2 and this one is CP2 blown up at a point. Um, and so one really interesting thing that happens in these hypertoric varieties is you get the toric variety of each one of those polytopes sitting inside the hypertoric variety in such a way that it's holomorphic or you know, a complex submanifold for I and Lagrangian for the other two symplectic structures from UJ and UK. Um, yeah, so these are, are quite interesting subvarieties. Um, and since it's Lagrangian, it's half dimensional. So I have these different toric varieties in here and in the neighborhood around those, this hypertoric variety looks like it's the cotangent bundle to each one of those guys. So you should think of it as kind of, you have the cotangent bundles of these different toric varieties, and then you kind of plumb them together. So here, I've taken T star CP2 and I've glued one of the lines in the CP2 to the exceptional fiber of the blow up, uh, right? In, in the world of this CP2, uh, this guy uh, is the exceptional fiber of the blow up and I glue it in to be one of the lines in the other CP2. And they're meeting in such a way that like, okay, it's hard to, Hard to draw this, but it uh, they behave like two intersecting uh, subspaces of the dimensions you would expect. So two two-dimensional complex subspaces intersecting in a line. All right. So for example, um, to get a T star PN, well, we already saw how to do that you take the diagonal action. And what that corresponds to in this hyperplane picture is that I map Rn into Rn plus one as, ooh, I shouldn't have put sum zero, um, all the things with some fixed sum. All right. And that gives me a hyperplane arrangement. In this case, it's a rather boring one. I, I end up with the simplex and I just extend all of its faces linearly. Um, on the other hand, there's sort of a, an example that's kind of dual to this guy where instead of taking the sum of all the coordinates to be zero, I take the line 
that's spanned by one, 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 and I translate that somewhere else in the space. Um, if you think about what happens there, well, as long as my lambda one up through lambda n are generic, I'm gonna hit all of the different coordinate subspaces at different points on my line. So I end up with n different points on my line and the toric varieties I see, here's a P1, here's a P1, here's a P1. What I end up with is a resolution of the quotient of C2 by the cyclic group of order N acting in the only symplectic way possible. So the reason I have E to the two I K over N here and E to the minus two uh, pi I K, uh, it's exactly this thing I was saying about the circle rotating one way on half of the quaternions and rotating the other way on the other half of the quaternions. Um, and sort of famously, this is a singular algebraic variety and it has a unique crepent resolution where it just comes if you just keep blowing up the singular points again and again. And uh, the fiber over the singular point looks like a bunch of P1s that kiss at various points. Um, this is a slightly misleading picture. These P1s, they're actually intersecting transversely in a four real dimensional space, right? I've, the P1s are two real dimensional and uh, they're in a four real dimensional space, which is of course, kind of hard to draw. This is another famous example of a hyperkähler manifold, which is that this hyperkähler metric on the reduction, it isn't exactly the same as, but it gets close to the metric induced from the metric on C2 when I take this quotient. So when I take this quotient, I get an orbifold away from the one singular point, gets me a nice smooth metric. And this hyperkähler guy approaches this one, which is flat, as I get further and further away from the origin. Um, and this is what's called asymptotically locally Euclidean or ALE. So you'll often hear, uh, or maybe not often, but you'll sometimes, if you hang out in the right circles, hear about ALE spaces. And these are examples of ALE spaces. So these are all kind of interesting symplectic manifolds in their own right, but they actually have this kind of more complicated hyperkähler structure where there's a bunch of different symplectic structures and a bunch of different complex structures um, uh, colliding with each other. So for example, this, you know, realizing this is C2 mod this quotient, that's only one of the complex structures. And again, just like uh, what we saw with Pn, uh, if you rotate to the I or J complex structure, you'll actually get an affine algebraic variety. You'll get um, an affine algebraic variety that looks like um, the hypersurface in uh, C3 defined by X, Y is equal to Z to the N plus a1 to the n minus one plus dot 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 up through a n, where a one up through a n depend on the complex moment map level. So again, you have this one underlying manifold, but you, when you choose different complex structures, you get these kind of things that are all algebraic varieties, but different algebraic varieties, very different properties, right? Um, so sort of the complex structures I've mainly been discussing here 
are not affine because they contain projective varieties inside them, but then you can hyperkalar rotate and get them as actually affine varieties. Um, and uh, I correctly anticipated that I was not going to have an enormous amount of time. So, you know, again, like uh, we could do a whole lecture on generalizations of this one very important generalization that, again, you may or may not have heard of are what are called Nakajima quiver varieties. Um, and these, instead of being based on tori, are based on a quiver is a graph with a bunch of edges. And on each of these edges, we put quaternion valued matrices of some size, depending on a number I assign to each one of these nodes. Um, and then this is acted on by the product of the unitary groups for each of these nodes. And you can do a hyperkalar quotient of this guy, and that's what's called the Nakajima quiver variety. Yeah. Lots of interesting things come up this way. Uh, I'm happy to discuss them more, but I think it's sort of getting a, a little far afield to start talking about all these guys. Uh, do, do, do. So this is a, a manifestation of a very general story, which is that you can take real constructions that give you something Kähler. So in the example above, thinking about CN and doing real symplectic reduction there. And if you complexify that further, you'll get something hyper -Kaler. So um, I, this is what I was writing at the start of class and didn't have time to, to do out in great detail. But for example, uh, we talked before about flat connections um, in a principal bundle on a two manifold B for some group G. Um, and if you choose a complex structure on the underlying surface, that will give you a Kähler structure on that space of flat connections. You need to put a complex structure on the space of one forms. Um, all right, so um, how can I complexify this further? Well, I can also choose a complex structure on the group. I can choose a complex, I might as well think of as GC for G, a compact group. So uh, this makes the space of connections hyperkalar. So one of the topics I proposed for a uh, final project is the non-abelian Hodge correspondence, which one way of thinking about this is it's related to thinking about this hyperkalar space of connections and thinking about how it manifests under the I, J, and K uh, complex structures. which sort of, you know, somehow use both the fact that the underlying surface has a complex structure and the fact that the group has a complex structure. 
those kind of together give you this hyperkähler picture. Um, but the, the final example I wanted to get a little bit into. So you'll note here, this is an infinite dimensional hyperkähler reduction. You have the space of connections, which I'm now gonna make hyperkähler. It's infinite dimensional, but there's another uh, very important case where you can do an infinite dimensional hyperkähler quotient and get an unexpected um, complex structure, which is um, if you have a simple Lie algebra, well, if I have a simple Lie algebra over R, let me say for a compact group, then its smooth co-adjoint orbits are Kähler. Um, and it turns out uh, they're you know, copies of, of flag varieties, partial flag varieties. And if I instead do this over C, they will actually be hyper Kähler. Um, and this is a, a very unexpected structure. Um, it was only noticed in the 90s by Kronheimer. Um, so it's, it's sort of a surprising fact. Now these are, are not very explicit as hyperkähler metrics. Um, and in particular, you prove this by writing them as hyperkähler, infinite dimensional hyperkähler quotients. Uh, yeah, okay, I've got 20 minutes. We'll see how much of this I get through. Okay, there's an incredibly rough idea, which I'm not gonna explain the details of which is that you can write these as moduli spaces of instantons on R4 with special boundary conditions. And so this hyper Kähler structure sort of comes from the fact that R4 is the quaternions. Uh, that's, that's secretly what's going on here. But there's a slightly less fancy way of thinking about this story. You can, you know, these instantons, this is uh, anti-self-dual connections. Um, We'll set those aside for a moment and do something much more concrete. So we start with the Lie algebra of G for G, a compact and let's say simple, simple group. So we consider the space of smooth maps from the interval into this Lie algebra, which remember is real. So I'm thinking about like the Lie algebra of SUN or something. I tensor that with the quaternions. So you can think of that as you complexify the Lie algebra and then you take another copy of it. You take its cotangent bundle. So well, such a map I can write and I'll often wanna break it up into these components as a zero plus A1 times I plus A2 times J plus A3 times K. All right, so thinking about it this way, it's quite obvious that we have an action of the uh, quaternions on tangent spaces because you know, just everything is a quaternion space. Um, so this makes my whole space of such smooth maps hyper k -wise where uh, the ultimate metric comes from the fact uh, I'm going to be just implicitly using everywhere G has a non-degenerate killing form on it. So I pair A and it's conjugate with each other under the killing form. And then I integrate that over the interval. And that gets me a metric on this space. And this carries an action of my gauge group, which is smooth maps from the interval into G. This uh, action is maybe not what you would first imagine. I don't just apply the adjoint action. I have to do something a little different, uh, basically because I wanna think of this A0 as giving me a connection on the principal bundle on the interval. And that actually tells me a, a different action I should do on A0 um, with this extra term G dot times G inverse. That basically uh, accounts for the covariant derivative. Um, 
So when I act on A, all the other components just get conjugated in a boring way, but the real part gets changed by adding in this extra term, G dot G inverse. All right. So this action is hyper Hamiltonian and its moment map is given by these formulas. So um, I have the derivative of A1, A2, A3, it's bracket with A0, and then uh, the sum of the bracket of the other two. And this can all be derived from these formulas we had before about how you act on um, yeah. Oh, this is way up here. Yeah, I'm obviously going too far. Um, right, this formula. It's just a rephrasing of this formula. So this is actually less fancy than the story we had before about curvature being a moment map. All right. And uh, these equations on the right-hand side uh, here are often called the NOM equations. They're quite famous in differential geometry. Uh, again, at least assuming you talk to the right people. And you might kind of wonder if this has anything to do with this story about Yang Mills we had before. And I wanna emphasize it's complicated. Um, there is some relationship, but uh, it's not sort of something totally obvious. One thing I will say is you can think of this moment map as measuring you think of your A0, A1, A2, A3 as a connection on the interval times R3, which is constant in the R3 direction. And if you do that, then these formulas on the right-hand side are, well, they're not all of the curvature, they're the anti-self-dual part of the curvature. Um, and so you're, you're getting some story about instantons instead of flat connections. Um, so it's not, it's not quite the same, but some of the same ingredients are showing up. Um, maybe one kind of key point here is I'm really exploiting the fact that uh, R4 is the quaternions, right? Before I was using special stuff about surfaces, now I'm using special stuff about R4. All right, well, that's all interesting, but this is also, you know, you can just think of this as some basic algebra. And so ignoring any fancy stuff about anti-self-dual curvature, et cetera, we can do hyper-Hamiltonian reduction. We don't wanna do this for the whole gauge group. We only wanna do it for the subgroup where G0, where the interval, I'm doing a trivial transformation. So I can, stuff about the ends of the interval, I can kind of fix. Um, right. And it turns out when I do this hyper Hamiltonian reduction, I get a finite dimensional hyper Kähler manifold. So the metric is induced by the one we had before. Um, and you can actually write down explicit formulas for the Kähler potential for the different complex structures. Or, or I should say for the different symplectic forms. Now it turns out this isn't just any old random hyper Kähler manifold. It's actually the cotangent bundle of the group itself. So this is kind of slightly easier than trying to get the co joint orbits yet. Um, so we're just getting the cotangent bundle of the group. 
And the proof of this is kind of cool. So what you do is you think about the complexification of the gauge group. So as before, I can take the quaternions and kind of break that into two copies of the complex numbers. And so I can think of a0 plus i a1 as one complex value, complexified Lie group valued map and a2 plus i a3 as another one. And I can think of a0 plus i a1 is giving me a connection, but now on the complexified for the uh, trivial bundle for the complexified group. And what I can do is parallel transport by that connection from zero to one. So I'm doing this in the trivial group. So I can start at the origin and then uh, not the origin, the identity, and lift up the path that goes from zero to one into the principal bundle. And that lift, well, that's just a function from the interval into G. It's uh, not going to be in this G zero, because it might have non-trivial value at the end. Its value at one is exactly measuring as I went along this connection, how much did I rotate my group? Um, and I can use that guy to trivialize the connection, right? If I just take my connection form and tilt it so that that section is flat, then I'll be, get it, I'll be getting, oh, I have a trivial um, connection. All right. So I can use that guy G to trivialize things. And then, well, I'm still going to have some A2 and some A3, but then I look at the moment map conditions and the equations that mu j and mu k are zero. Those are preserved by doing these complex uh, transforms. And the equations exactly say that A2 and A3 are constant. So, after applying G here, I get to my A, I get zero comma some constant in the complexified Lie group, uh, sorry, Lie algebra. And so by taking my connection, or not my connection, my, my function into the quaternionized guy and sending it to what was the parallel transfer from zero to one for the connection given by A0 plus I A1. And then once I gauge transform that away, what's the constant I'm left with in the J and K coordinates in the quaternions. Um, this gives me an isomorphism to T star of GC, which is of course, isomorphic to um, GC times G dual. And, you know, that might sound very trivial, but for example, what this Kähler potential is when you transport through the isomorphism is not easy. Um, yeah, so, uh, like even in this case, you get a weird complex structure. Um, okay, I got 10 minutes left. All right, I'm not doing too bad. I know I'm going through this really fast, maybe too fast. So uh, please ask questions if you have any. Okay, I don't know. I think this is a pretty interesting story, but uh, it took me a while to, to absorb it, so. Um, in order to get adjoint orbits instead, which is actually quite a bit more interesting, I have to kind of modify my picture. And instead of being on a finite interval, I'm going to be on an infinite one. So starting at zero and going off to infinity, but I need to have some boundary condition at infinity. And what I'm gonna to require to do is that A1, A2, A3 converge to some fixed constants in the Cartan subalgebra exponentially fast.
and I, the sort of natural set of gauge transformations to look at acting on this. Well, if I take all gauge transformations, I'm going to mess up where how I act. I'm going to mess up my boundary condition. So I have to assume that my limit as I go out to infinity stabilizes these boundary conditions, tau one, tau two, and tau three. Um, and then I have some G, the G zero, which is, well, I require at the origin that I'm doing a trivial transformation. So as before, looking at solutions to these noms equations, mod gauge gives me a hyperkähler manifold. And in the case where uh, tau two plus I tau three, that's an element of the complexification of the Lie algebra is regular. So if I'm thinking about actual matrices, this is a diagonal matrix. I want that all of its diagonal entries are distinct. Um, yeah, then I'm getting exactly a hyperkähler structure on the adjoint orbit, which is the same as the coadjoint orbit using the killing form of T1 plus I, oh, whoops, T2 plus I, T3. Sorry, messed that up. All right, the proof here is very similar. So again, I take my A0 plus I A1 and I choose a gauge transformation that makes that constant. So just look at the parallel transport as I start at zero and go out, that's going to eventually converge to something because my A1, A2, A3, and A0 all converge to some fixed limit. Um, do, do, do. I should have added here and I think I also want A0 to converge to zero. Um, all right. Now note that this is not going to be in this gauge group I defined before. I can't assume that my sort of eventual parallel transport lies in the carton. Um, so when I have A, I have a well-defined thing, which is when I do this parallel transport to trivial, to make my first component constant, what happens to the second component? So again, the moment, what happens is that guy has to converge to something. If you look carefully at Nam's equations, they no longer say that it has to be constant. So we'll, we'll get, I'll, discuss that in a minute. So I get a well-defined element of the adjoint. So this, when I write this conjugation, uh, I mean the adjoint action of G0 infinity on this element of the dual of the Lie algebra. Okay. So this is in the adjoint orbit of T2 plus I I'm using the killing form everywhere. So I could have said like add star G zero uh, of the element of the dual given by pairing with this guy. That's basically equivalent. All right. So it turns out that if T, T uh, tau two plus I tau three is regular, then you can use these noms equations to say, ah, well, this guy has to actually be constant and this map is an isomorphism. And so if that's the case, then you say, hooray, I found a co-joint orbit and it has a hyperkähler structure. And I still have a few minutes. So uh, one could easily stop there, but uh, let me just sort of say here at the end, um, but the quotient construction uh, works 
as long as there's as I, uh, tau one, tau two, and tau three sort of together are regular. Um, so if the, si the simultaneous centralizer of tau one, tau two, tau three is the carton. So tau two plus I tau three being regular, that's saying that the centralizer of just those guys is the carton. So you can have situations where, for example, these guys are zero, but this guy is regular and the hyperkähler quotient works perfectly well. So you're getting some sort of more interesting manifold there. And of course it can't be this adjoint orbit of uh, tau two plus I tau three um, because that would have dimension that was wrong. It's too small. So that's not the answer. Instead, what you get is you look at all of the matrices whose semi-simple part, or I should say elements of the group, whose semi, or yeah, sorry, of the Lie algebra, whose semi-simple part is this tau two plus I tau three. And you look at a generic adjoint orbit. So if it's possible to have these guys and have something non-semi-simple attached to them. You take the generic orbit in there. The closure of that is singular, but you get a, a Springer resolution of it. So, you know, the, the kind of example to, to keep in mind here is if I'm thinking in SUN, right? And tau two plus I tau three, this could have all distinct eigenvalues. Right? And in that case, there's, there's nothing with non-trivial nilpotent part, no matrix with non-trivial nilpotent part that this is the semi-simple part of, right? Is what you learned about Jordan decomposition. Um, on the other hand, I could have something like this guy is equal to zero, in which case I could take the, there are but any nilpotent matrix has semi-simple part given by zero. So I'd be taking a generic nilpotent orbit, which famously there's only one of called the regular nilpotent orbit. All right, do, do, do. Yeah. So for example, yeah, this, this is this case I was talking about where tau two and tau three are zero, but if T1 is regular, you can still see my hyperkähler quotient works out perfectly fine. And it's some hyperkähler rotation of the adjoint orbit of tau one, right? If I change my mind about which hyperkähler structure is which, I can turn this into a generic orbit. Um, so it's something which is topologically the same as a generic co-adjoint orbit or adjoint orbit, um, but with some different complex structure. And it turns out that what you're getting there is T star of the flag variety, which is the, the usual Springer resolution. Time, so let me not say much. Uh, I'll just mention you can get resolutions of smaller orbits by what's called this non-pole thing, where you add poles to your solutions. And you can check that if you're going to have solutions like this with uh, sigma i over t, um, then basically looking at the residue at the origin, you find that sigma one, sigma two, sigma three give you a copy of SU2. And famously copies of SU2 inside a semi-simple Lie algebra uh, correspond to nilpotent orbits in the complexification um, by uh, Jacobson Morisov. So you're getting stuff about the nilpotent orbit that comes from that SU2 embedding. All right, are there any questions? I have a question just um, not, but not, not about what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, when I've seen 
um, academic core varieties defined. I've usually seen them written down with, um, you know, uh, pairs of arrows going in both directions and so forth. And mm -hmm. so, so um, this is equivalent because you can think of, you know, the H as being, you know, a C as being the, 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 the cotangent bundle to C. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're getting, you're getting, anyway, that's very cool. So, I mean, that, that's really, that's really nifty. Um, you know, like, uh, it, it makes, I mean, it means that, I mean, you're just doing quiver represent, well, okay, they're not quite just doing quiver representations over H, right? Because there, there is this symplectic reduction step, right? But you're sort yeah. of doing the most reasonable thing you could be doing, or you're yeah. doing a very reasonable thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, I think the issue, uh, yeah, let me think about that. Well, yes, I think it's reasonable. <laughs> um, oh, but I mean, you present yeah. it in a way that makes it seem reasonable, is I guess my yeah. point. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's, I mean, it's really kind of cheating, um, uh, right here, because right, I, I'm looking at elements of UN, right? So exactly what's happening here is, um, that when I have my, oops, my matrices with, uh, quaternion entries, Um, right, then I can, well, I can write that as the direct sum of matrices the same size with C entries twice by just thinking of J and K as a second copy of C, right? And if you think about how does, you know, if I take the, the left action of UN on matrices, here, like, right, so one of these is going to be the usual action of UN on the right, and the other one is going to be the conjugate action, right? Like, you talked about this with S1, that you get the conjugate of E to the I theta. So now I'm getting the, the conjugate of my unitary matrix, um, which is, of course, the same as the inverse transpose. So I'm getting the dual representation. And so exactly sort of, if you wanna think about this as actual representations of UN, I'm getting T star of this guy. So it is, it, it's sort of sneaky. Um, yeah, and I mean, in, in, uh, Right, somehow, I, I don't think anyone other than Nakajima takes very seriously the fact that these quiver varieties actually have hyperkähler metric, metrics, right? Like um, somehow uh, Nakajima's whole like inspiration for thinking about quiver varieties was like trying to understand instantons. Um, yeah, so, so sorry, I'm, I, I, I had a connection issue. So I lost, I lost actually what you said. I mean, and I don't, I, I, I don't know, I, I shouldn't, like ask you to repeat more of it, but it was, um, but. Uh, uh, sorry, like what I said that corresponded to what's written here on the page? I think, no, I think I got everything that, I think I understand what you've written on the page. But so then after that, uh, you, you started saying, well, it's kind of a cheat and you wrote down what you wrote down, which I understand. And then I don't, don't know what happened. Oh, can you, can um, you, Sorry, I was, I was just it, saying was that it all like- recorded? It was all recorded. It was all, it recorded. Was all recorded. I can just, yes. I can just listen to the recording. Yeah. Okay, I'll listen um, to the recording. I mean, okay. That's, okay. I, I don't want it. Yeah, I, I mean, I was mostly just saying like, you know, um, so one of the things I maybe should have mentioned but didn't is, you know, in, when I was describing hyper reduction, right? I sort of said, oh, well, you can think of it as this two-step process where you restrict to the zero level the complex moment map, and then you do a Hamiltonian reduction. Well, if you remember, there's, you know, there's this theorem that tells you that doing Hamiltonian reductions can be rephrased in terms of GIT theory. Um, and so you can also think of that as I restrict the, the complex moment map level, and then I do a GIT quotient for the complexified group. Right. And this is, you know, like if you read almost any paper or any, you know, I don't know if there are books about Nakajima quiver variety, but almost any, you know, paper about Nakajima quiver varieties will describe it that way. 
Um, whereas like Nakajima's original papers described it as a hypercalar quotient. And he was like really thinking about like instantons on four manifolds, right? Okay. Um, right, so some have like this stuff about like ALE spaces, um, you know, like one of, one of the kind of original inspirations for all of the story is that like ALE spaces can be written as Nakajima quiver varieties for uh, the affine Dinkin diagrams. Um. Okay. And I'm I'm sorry. You just mentioned a, a somewhat relatedly. You just mentioned a thing that that that, that we can think of symplectic reduction as GIT for the complexified group. Did when did we did we talk about that? No, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Then I feel better for not remembering when we talked about it. No, we didn't. Um, talk, sorry. Um, uh, Roxandra Mararu is actually teaching graduate course like on GIT right now that's supposed to cover that fact. So I didn't cover it, but um, I mean, there's this, uh, it's called the kempf Ness theorem. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, I've at least heard uh, reference to that. Which says that um, if you have a uh, yeah, probably I shouldn't try to state it properly, but you know, basically the idea is that a symplectic reduction for a compact group will be the same as a GIT quotient for the corresponding complex group. Um, okay, but, you know, basically, so like, like in the case of S S one, we'd be talking about like doing doing symplectic reduction for S one versus doing yeah. GIT for C star. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. And you know, somehow, like in the examples where we've we've gone through this, we've seen that this is true. And what always happens is, well, you look at an orbit of the complex group, and GIT says, you know, some of those are good and some of those are bad and should be thrown out. And it turns out, like, if you're a good orbit, then you you're a good orbit if and only if you intersect the moment map level for the compact group. And if you do, then you intersect it in exactly one orbit for the compact group. Okay. Right. And this, okay, you know, this cool. for example happened with with Pn, right? That if you think of C P n minus one as a, a GIT quotient of C of the n, what you do is you say, okay, the origin is bad, get rid of it. And now I mod out by C star. And exactly what happens with the symplectic reduction is that you get, um, you know, you get a circle in each one of those C star orbits, uh, if and only if, you know, as, as the the level of the the moment map. Yeah, and then you so in the hypercalar world, you can apply this to the the zero level of the complex moment map. Um, okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. That's 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 very helpful, actually. Uh, any other questions? All right. Whew. Okay. Uh, then I will stop recording.